Today before uh, committee, we have a presentation by the U.S. General Service uh, Administration on budgeting practices for major software initiatives. Um, this is uh, an organization that was brought to our attention by Senate Fiscal after attending an in 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 NCSL uh, conference. So we're very, very pleased to invite up Waldo uh, Jaquith. Waldo, thank you for being here today. We appreciate your time and travel. I think you have a couple members, but they're actively engaged uh, within some of the departments discussing uh, what you're bringing before this, uh, this body. So we appreciate you taking time to be here today, and uh, please proceed. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Yes, my name is Waldo Jaquith, and I'm with uh, 18F, uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about a different way that the Michigan Senate could budget for major software procurements. Uh, 18F is the federal government's tech shop. We were created after the legendary healthcare.gov debacle in which the federal government learned exactly how not to procure major software for major initiatives. Uh, we act as sort of technology fixers for federal, state, and local government. Um, 18F, by the way, is so named just because we're headquartered at uh, GSA at 18th and F Streets. That's where the, the cute name comes from. We've been around for six years. It's a fully distributed team of 150 people. I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, for instance. It's a cross-functional team of software developers, uh, user experience designers, uh, project managers, lawyers, and experts in data and security and procurement. Our mission is to help our partners in government, federal and state, deliver better digital services to people at a lower cost to taxpayers and with a lower risk of failure. So I am a Fed. I'm a career software developer. I also work in procurement as a contracting officer's representative, and my personal focus is working with states. Uh, by the way, normally we need to be hired. In this case, I'm fortunate to be here because uh, GSA has a funding uh, program for uh, ideas for how the government can be more effective called 10X, and 10X has funded us being able to work with three states to help them budget more effectively for technology. Michigan is the first state that we are working with and have chosen to work with because we have been extremely impressed by the people who we have encountered from Michigan at conferences that we've attended about uh, budgeting and, uh, and technology generally. Uh, so I'm grateful to 10X for funding my appearance here. Uh, taxpayer dollars fund my time here so y'all can use it as you see fit. This is the second of two days that I and my team of two other people are spending in Lansing preaching the good word of what we call agile budgeting practices. We've now held brief workshops with DTMB with the uh, folks from the Senate Fiscal Agency, and uh, I ducked out on my other two coworkers who are spending the entire day with MDHHS. So thank you for having me here for a little bit to talk about this. Uh, you have in front of you this, I promise it's not boring. We wrote it to be interesting. I shared it with friends and family who at least claim that it's interesting and written to be accessible. In particular, I mean, the whole thing is, is written for legislators. But uh, Appendix A, which begins on page 34, is questions to ask. They're actual questions you can ask when people want a lot of money from you for software, complete with what right answers and wrong answers look like. Because, as you've discovered frequently, when there are matters of technology before you, you can find yourself buried in buzzwords or lingo that means nothing, I'm going to begin here with something a little unusual. We usually take one day to teach people the basic concepts that you need to understand in order to get how to budget effectively and procure software effectively. And I'm gonna to try to teach that to you in 15 minutes. And we'll better position you next time people try to bury you in buzzwords that you will be able to understand what they're talking about here. I'm gonna open with a rule of thumb. No individual software project should cost more than $10 million. No single procurement should be more for more than $2 million. If you spend more than that, you are going to fail. And the less you spend, the greater your likelihood of success. There are some rare exceptions, like SACWIS systems, NMMISs, where you can spend slightly more, but you're more likely to fail. And that's like going to a math conference and opening with pi is exactly three. But I, I want to establish here that the practices that are frequently used result in failure, and quite predictably so. So what I'm saying sounds unreasonable. I'm going to try to make it reasonable here. You're going to learn six things real quick. User-centered design, agile software development, product ownership, DevOps, building out of loosely coupled parts and modular contracting. Once we're all on the same page about those things, then I'll explain to you how you can modify your budgeting, oversight, expectations, and practices to make it way more likely that the technical work that you fund will succeed so it stops feeling like a gamble 
and more like an ongoing investment that you can actually manage. This isn't some crazy idea dreamed up on the flight here. This is what we do at ATNF working with state and federal agencies. We lead them through planning and executing major software procurements using exactly these methods. So let's dive in. One out of six, user-centered design. This is real easy. All work that's done needs to be centered on satisfying the needs of actual end users of the software who test it at every step of the way. Work is only performed if those actual end users approve it or in the service of their identified needs, and the work isn't finished until the users say that it is. You do what the actual relevant humans need and not what their boss's boss thinks that they need. That's it. Use center design. That's the, that's the core of all this stuff. Second, agile software development. There's a buzzword some of you all have heard, agile. Another straightforward concept. Up front, you plan a software project in the broadest of strokes with a roadmap, with a brief description of the goals, and you don't worry about anything too much more specific than that. Work is done in cycles of about two weeks. Day one, you plan what you'll do for the next two weeks. And on day 10, you look back, see what you did over the next two weeks, and then plan the next two weeks, and you repeat. And you don't look ahead more than two weeks because you've no idea what the future holds. Political demands will change, political leadership will change, reality won't match your theories, pressures will change. So don't make trouble for yourself by trying to plan farther ahead. In this approach, functioning software, this is real important for y'all, functioning software is delivered every two weeks. No excuses, fully tested, fully documented, ready to be used if in a crude state at first. You don't wait three years, every two weeks. In this way, value is delivered constantly until the software gets good enough to be deployed for broad use by the actual end users, and then you keep delivering value every two weeks until you run out of money or all the work is done, whichever comes first. In this approach, government owns all of the software. The vendor owns nothing. You wouldn't buy a car with a hood welded shut. Why would you buy software that you can't maintain or modify? And if the vendor is bad, you fire them and you hire a new one who picks up where the old one left off, and you can do this because they're delivering tested, documented code every two weeks. And in about three minutes, we'll talk about how you can hire new vendors rapidly. This is how all competent software developers work now. This is not crazy. This is not weird. This is utterly normal. 91% of software developers use this methodology to develop software. Think of planning a drive around the country, vacation with your family. You could try to schedule weeks in advance, plotting out your exact route, reserving hotel rooms, buying tickets for attractions, but you would never do that, it wouldn't work because reality is too messy. You'd plan the general direction, the highlights you want to hit, put together a broad route, and you'd figure out the specifics as you go. Don't use a methodology to procure major software to run your government that you wouldn't use for a family vacation. It doesn't work. Number three of six, product ownership. Central to Agile is the idea that somebody has to be in charge of what the development team does every two weeks. This is called the product owner. The job of the product owner is to, to ensure that that team is doing the right work and then that they've done the work right. This is not some other duties as assigned job. This is an agency employee, not something you pass to DTMB. This is the actual agency that is procuring this work. They have a person that spends hours of work on this every day, an empowered stakeholder. This person is the interface between the government and the vendor, representing the financial interest of the state and the needs of end users able to speak for the agency. It's essential that this person be a government employee. This cannot be outsourced. And God help you if you outsource it to the vendor who's doing the work because now you've handed everything over to the vendor. Number four of six, DevOps. It's an obnoxious word, but hear me out. This is the practice of automating the work that goes into testing and deploying software to wherever the end users will use it, merging software development, dev, and system operations. The people with the laptops who build the software and the people in the basement who manage the servers. It's getting these people to work together. Under DevOps, testing of software quality is automatic. Deployment of software to whatever servers it's gonna live on is automatic. When multiple developers work on code at the same time, integration of their changes is automatic. Under DevOps, the developers are responsible for the code running properly wherever it's gonna run. They can't throw it over the fence to an agency and say, good luck, it worked for us, and walk away as things explode in the background behind them. Again, this is how all competent software developers work now. I'm not picturing anything extraordinary. Number five of six, building out of loosely coupled parts. Large software projects are doomed to fail. They collapse under their own weight of administration, so they must be broken down into a handful of smaller quasi-independent software projects. Each one of these components communicates with each other through simple modular standards so that anyone can be swapped out at any time. In this way, you don't build a monolith that everybody will hate in five years. You build a little ecosystem in which each piece can be upgraded and modified easily as changing needs will always, always demand. 
This is how electricity works. I don't need to talk to my power company before I buy a lamp. I can plug it into the wall. We know what outlets look like. This is how Legos work. There's a bump on the top. There's a hole in the bottom. You put them together, and then you step on them when your kid leaves them on the floor. This is how cloud works. When you hear about cloud software, that's exactly what cloud means. These loosely coupled parts behind Amazon Web Services, Azure, and so on, and all the organizations that rely on cloud, this is how they run their infrastructure. Software in this arrangement talks with other software. You might have heard of an API, an application programming interface. This is just how software talks to software. To send an email or a, a, a calendar invitation or to load a web page, you don't need to wonder if your browser supports the server, if the person you're emailing uses Oracle like you do. It doesn't matter. They all speak the same language. So if you want to get an email client and an email server, those vendors don't have to talk to each other. Those are completely independent decisions. This is that loosely coupled architecture intermediated by those APIs. So for each of these components we're describing, you'd have a team of about five to nine developers working independently, maybe at the same vendor, maybe at different vendors, whatever. But each of them can work relatively in isolation the same way that your vendors don't have to talk to each other between your email client and email server. Number six, then we'll wrap up the training component here. Number six, modular contracting. By employing all these things, this is user-centered design, agile, DevOps, building out of loosely coupled parts, you can now break one huge, risky contract into a handful of smaller contracts. You want the contract to be small enough that you'll have no compunction about firing a non-performing vendor, knowing the rest of the vendors or teams will continue working and your total loss of velocity will be minimal. By using these small contracts, each contract can come within your state's simplified procurement threshold, $500,000 here, meaning that if you can do that for the smallest te teams, agencies can write an RFP, publish it, review responses, and award a contract within 60 days. And I want to emphasize again that this is what we do. We have DOD doing it at 45 days, and we said, whoa, slow down. That's too fast. Uh, when you think of procurements in this way, it goes so much easier and so much faster. So a rule of thumb I want to give you. One of these software development teams, these five to nine people, costs a million bucks a year if you don't care where in Michigan they are. If you want them to be here, I mean, 8% of your economy is tech. But those developers aren't all in Lansing. So if you want them in Lansing, you've just took it up to about $2 million a year. Matter of your priorities, but you can cut that development price in, in half. So you want to know how to budget for these things? You want estimates? The question is, how many teams do we need for how long? It's a million bucks a piece or possibly two million, depending on where you want to price that. You can price things out in neat development team years. So I'm going to summarize here with um, five things you must not do or require your agencies to do. Number one, do not insist on receiving detailed requirements about the exact functionality that will be implemented when. They'll give it to you, but they'll be lies. They don't know. Or worse, they'll actually do it like that, despite when evidence uncovers as you actually talk to users that you shouldn't do it like that. Number two, not to do. Don't have a vendor spend months or years developing software, only delivering value to users when the project is done. You can't oversee something you can't see. Third thing not to do, don't build a monolith. You gotta build a system out of these loosely coupled parts. Number four thing not to do, do not award a contract for more than a couple million dollars, or rather allow them to, or with a period of performance longer than a year with maybe a couple years to renew, but you gotta cap that, including the renewals at three years. And finally, don't spend more than $10 million on any single system in a single budget allocation. Looking at the actual tables of software development projects over the course of government uh, over many years, your odds of success if you're spending 10 million bucks are almost zero. It's just not gonna work. Throwing more money at the problem makes it worse. And some of you, if you are thinking this can't possibly work, it would be a look like, like looking at somebody in a hot air balloon and yelling, human flight is impossible. We're doing this, our clients are doing this, it works great. So I have now given you two days of information, day and a half and 15 minutes, and I want to conclude here by telling you why this matters, why this is important and what you can do with this. So there's a consultancy group named the Standish Group. For many years, they've analyzed the, the success and failure rate of both private sector and public sector government software projects. They have found that if you spend more than $6 million in US, 13% succeed in terms of cost schedule and performance. That's appalling. And it doesn't even mean that 13%. That just means that what was delivered was exactly what was requested. That doesn't necessarily what the users needed. That's just when somebody wrote a contract four years before, they thought maybe that was what people needed. So that's crazy and totally familiar to you. What you have here is a normal rate of failure for government software. Your experience here is normal. And the really maddening thing is we all know it doesn't have to be that way. 
We're living in this time where technology in our lives keeps getting better and cheaper and more reusable. We all walk around with these phones that let us order a new pair of shoes as we walk down the street and have them delivered to our house the very next day. There's this huge gap between the customer service experience that people have in their everyday lives and the ones they have with government. But why? We have smart people in government. We have plenty of smart people working for tech vendors. Why are government tech projects so hard and slow and expensive and prone to failure? Finding an answer to that question is what got me started in this work five years ago. Trying to find ways to deliver better service to people and be smarter about how government buys, builds, and reuses technology. And the answer to my shock as a technologist turned out to be one word, procurement. Government is lousy at buying technology. Imagine if every time you wanted to buy that new pair of shoes, instead of tapping on your phone a few times, you had to do the work, the pain, the paperwork, the red tape of buying a house. Buying things in government has become such a hassle and feels so risky that folks both in and outside of government want to do it as infrequently as possible. And that leads to huge RFPs, huge contracts, and only big companies can afford to wade through those things and bid on them. When it comes to buying technology, it's, it's so bad because government agencies don't have the tech talent on staff to know what they want to buy or to decide between good and bad proposals or know whether the state is getting what they asked for or what they need. But the good news is, given the position you're in on this committee, there are a number of things you can do to help. And that is why I'm excited to be here to have a chance to share some specific suggestions for how y'all and your colleagues in government can help state agencies become smarter buyers of technology and related services. So in the spirit of numbered lists, here are six specific steps that you can take. The first is you've got to encourage your agencies to rethink risk. Traditionally, agencies have tried to reduce the risk of failure by writing better contracts, and it turns out that doesn't work. The bottom line is government cannot outsource all the risk, and it can't outsource its mission. Longer, more complicated contracts with more requirements and more conditions on vendors isn't the answer. We've been going down that road for 30 years. That leads to big vendors, and when things go bad, big legal battles. So what's the alternative? So first, agencies have to stop signing big contracts. Remember that 13% success rate on contracts over six million? That same report finds that contracts under one million have a 57% success rate. Smaller contracts are three times more likely to succeed than ones over six million. Breaking up big projects into smaller pieces not only lowers the financial risk by compartmentalizing how much that failure dollar value could be, but it means those modules can be designed to deliver value to users quickly with low upfront costs, and that way, even if one piece fails or you need to change vendors, it's easy to recover, and it doesn't threaten the entire project. Remember how modern software is built with these modules like Legos, you can change them out at low cost without impacting other parts, they're all connected by APIs. That's how projects should be built and funded. And it's also smart if you take the time to be clear about desired outcomes, instead of expecting vendors to read your mind or tell you what's most important. You gotta pay vendors for delivering working code and demos, not strategy documents and memos. For example, contracts should provide that vendors will continue to be paid when the state can actually access and use software while it's under development, not when vendors deliver a long memo describing their plans to complete that software. When it comes to tech projects, you reduce risk by seeing demos, not memos. That is the best form of oversight. You don't wanna see reports. You wanna see working software. Here's an easy rule of thumb. If a software project won't deliver value outcomes to users in six months, it needs to be rescoped. It's too big, it's too complex. And if this committee could start asking that question before funding big projects, it would be a game changer for the state and how major software projects are designed and delivered. Second change, don't worry, these get shorter as I go. Ask your agencies how they're minimizing the cost of inev inevitable change before choosing a vendor and how they're planning on change from the beginning. The only certainty with technology is things are gonna keep changing and fast. So policy also changes and vendors may need to change. So flexibility is critical. That is why it's smart to plan for minimizing the cost of change from the start. The best way to do that is to stop getting locked into single vendor contracts or proprietary solutions because it's the cheap way to get started. It's a trap. Ask agencies about their plans to minimize future costs of changing technology and changing vendors. Ask what's being done to prevent the state from being locked into single vendor contracts and proprietary solutions. Because as you know, just because a vendor is the cheapest to get started with doesn't mean they'll be the most cost effective over time. I'm struck, by the way, in these remarks to listening to the prior discussion about transportation funding. There are some strong parallels there. 
Ask about the long-term costs of maintaining the service and the availability of open source tools, which over time are more flexible, reusable, sustainable, and secure. And whatever you do, be sure to ask agencies what they're doing to ensure the state keeps ownership over its data and those APIs. The long-term value in government technology initiatives is often the data. So instead of giving that away or only being allowed access if the state pays big fees to a vendor, make sure your agencies can easily and affordably access and use its data for the public good now and for years to come. Third of six here, ask your agencies how they plan to share, learn, and collaborate with other states or other agencies when building and buying tech tools. There is no reason why every state and agency needs to reinvent the wheel on technology solutions. When it comes to delivering services to citizens, you're really not that different. So sharing solutions, learning from each other, and collaborating on new frameworks and regulations makes sense, not only for delivering value to people faster, but it's better for businesses, because consistency means lower compliance costs. They don't want to figure out 50 different sets of regulations and standards between states. Number four, ask agencies what they're doing to attract new vendors who may not currently work with government and what they're doing to change their procurement practices so the vendors will want to work with Michigan. If you want to attract new vendors who have proven records delivering good tech tools in the private sector, agencies need to stop putting everyone through the trouble of buying a house when all they re really need is a pair of shoes. So streamline procurement practices for those sub $2 million software procurements. Contract templates are being passed down from contracting officer to contracting officer like treasured family heirlooms. Nothing ever gets taken out. Stuff only gets added in. They gotta get rid of that unneeded contract language. It scares away new and smaller vendors. And Michigan, as I mentioned, has like this robust and growing tech sector, 8% of your state economy. The sooner you can get Michigan businesses involved in working with your agencies, the better off you'll be. More competition is better for the state and you'll get better digital services at a lower price. Fifth thing to do, encourage and incentivize your agencies to hire in-house tech talent and make sure tech folks are in the room from the beginning of new projects. Digital service delivery in government is not going away. will grow enormously every year. You should be hiring and budgeting for this as a normal cost of operations. You gotta stop viewing these tech projects as one-time capital expenses and begin budgeting for them as what they are. Ongoing, never-ending tools that are constantly improving based on changing user needs and feedback. The best way to ensure the public gets digital services that are better and faster and cheaper is to hire knowledgeable program and technical people, to integrate the program and technical teams together from the beginning of a project, and to budget for technology as this normal operating expense instead of some extraordinary capital expense that nobody could see coming. Agencies hiring developers directly to oversee that work means you can get rid of IV and V, y'all heard of this, independent verification and validation. This is, this is a process by which instead of reading vendors' reports about how they're doing, you pay somebody else to read the vendor's reports and they write new reports about those reports and they give them to you to read. IVNV does not add value. <laughs> Instead of demos, not memos, you're getting memos about memos and this is not the rhyme that I want you to be remembering here. You can't expect success if you treat technology as something separate that can be bolted on after the fact. That doesn't work. Technology undergirds nearly all government initiatives now. If the tech fails, the initiative fails. So finally, number six, Leadership needs to engage and lead this charge. Change is hard, especially in government. If folks are asked to do something in a new way, they need to know their leaders will provide air cover if and when things go wrong. Otherwise, they'll be afraid to try new approaches. The idea is you want things to go wrong at the price tag of a million or two million, not 200 million. So we've been talking to agencies yesterday and today, talking to DTMB, and a theme is that they need the space to learn and make mistakes. And the theme we're telling them is make it a lower dollar value and maybe that'll be okay, but you all need to give them the space to do that. So you have to encourage these agencies to stop doing studies and just do the thing. Find a small pilot project and get started and you'll be amazed how much the agency and you learn. So I'm gonna include with this. I live in Virginia. The same party controls the legislature and the governor's office and there was a bill introduced this year, in January, with the support of the governor to create a paid family and medical leave program. The fiscal impact statement, or whatever y'all call them here, the, the, the cost of getting that, that uh, program created came in just a few weeks ago, second week of February, I think. Reporting the program would cost $70 million to set up. $60 million for the software, $10 million for everything else. The bill did not pass. We will not have a paid family and medical leave program this year because of software. As long as legislators regard technology as some uncontrollable externality, a pit into which money must be shoveled and burned until the vendor says, well, that'll do, then important programs will fail. 
New initiatives will never get off the ground. Important bills won't have a chance at passing. Either technology can be a blocker to progress or a tool that enables progress. A new approach to budgeting and oversight is necessary to get this right. That concludes my prepared remarks. I would be happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, we do have a question from Senator Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your uh, presentation. That was quite a bit of content, and I appreciate you working through it as quickly as you could, but there was a lot of really valuable stuff in there, so I really appreciate Thank it, you, and I'm going to go back and read through your uh, booklet that you gave us. Um, as I was listening to your comments, it reminded me of a, a situation um, in the Army. I serve in the Army part-time, and um, the Army went out and procured a bunch of new Blackhawks, um, I don't know, probably about 10 or 12 years ago, and they made a really impressive and sophisticated autopilot system on there, but they left the GPS technology through the software link up on that to where it couldn't do an instrument approach with the software that was included within it because it wasn't specifically articulated into the IT contract for the software within the, within the Blackhawks. So you got a bunch of $25 million Blackhawks sitting around the camp fly when you know, there's low cloud cover or something. Fully capable of doing it, it just there's a technicality within the software that doesn't allow it through the FAA standards to be permissive to be able to do it. So rather frustrating there. Um, but the very first thing you brought up was this um, idea of the user-centered design. Yes, and I think that's the most basic and most missing component of each of this. I, uh, I have an iPhone, and I think one of the best things about Apple is it's very intuitive. You don't have to really teach somebody how to use an iPhone. My two-year-old daughter can use an iPhone. Same. Yeah, <laughs> she can't read, but she can use an iPhone. And she can navigate through it and everything else because it is very intuitive based. And they've anticipated what that user is going to likely do at different scenarios and how they can make that, you know, to guide you in the right direction of what you're likely trying to accomplish. Um, my wife, on the other hand, works in our State Department of Health and Human Services, and uh, there's a pretty elaborate system for different types of assistance program, the Bridges system, and one of her complaints is that every time they build these systems, they don't really have the caseworker present in the room to say, hey, if we did this, how would your job be affected by that? Or if we did this in the system, would this work or not? And, and a big part of her job is what she calls bridges workarounds, which are workarounds to what the system is kind of ideally designed to do to deal with these exceptions that increasingly become more common. And so I feel like that's the, the most critically missing piece of all of this is that, that end user, like Apple's got it figured out. They know what the masses, the millions of people that are gonna use their phone are likely to, to view as that user interface. It seems like in government, our systems are not intuitive at all. They are, I mean, extremely not intuitive, the opposite of being intuitive, and therefore you have to have these skills of really having a unit of people that work around the norms of the system to accomplish that. Um, so I appreciate you, uh, you bringing that up, appreciate that. I, I guess my question to you would be, how do we get our state agencies and our departments that are building these systems to have those those end users, their, their caseworkers, or those that are gonna be interfacing with the public, or in the case of a public-facing system that you know, is gonna solicit input from the public, how do we get that put in there? How, is there any best practices for how we get that input from the people that have the most interaction with the system? Yes, Senator, thank you. It's a great question. Uh, my, my colleagues are, I think, at this very hour having a discussion at MDHHS about that exact question which they had for us, which is how do you actually make that transition? What does it look like? Um, I will give you an answer that should send chills down your spine, which is culture change. When somebody says culture change, you know that's an extremely difficult solution. That's the case here. And yeah. here, here's the challenge. The normal method, what we refer to as waterfall software development, where somebody on high says it will be like this, and for years people spend years developing exactly what usually that agency had or whatever said it must be like, and nobody ever goes back to see, should it be like that? So waterfall development is consistent with how government and for that matter businesses function, which is the highest paid person's opinion is what counts. What we're proposing here is the opposite. You should not listen to the head of the agency when designing software because it's immaterial. The most important people's opinions are the lowest paid employees. 
this is this sh shocks the conscience sometimes in agencies where it doesn't seem to them that's at all how it should work. But the reality is that the people who are most affected by this software are the least important people in the agency in terms of the org chart and the people who most need to be listened to. Mm -hmm. uh, the solutions to that are complicated. Uh, the specific methods of that are being laid out right now for DHHS, but I'll, I'll provide a, a story about work that we did with a state on this that I think will be illustrative. We are working on a, a Medicare management information system, MMISs, which are huge. There's a nine to one match in federal dollars for that. Um, so the federal government is a major investor in those programs, uh, and often there's interest in seeing <coughs> my, my team work on those. We were working with a state on this in which they managed to make the space to elevate the opinions of those people. And one of the, the, the way they were doing it, which is the way that we recommend, is with, uh, with people in the development team called user researchers. It may surprise you to learn, particularly for me as a software developer, that the least important, important people on those teams of five to nine people are the coders. Coding is easy. There's over two million people, according to Department of Labor in the US, who write software. It is ubiquitous skill of relatively low value. What is a really high value are the user researchers. Regrettably, they're paid much worse than developers, but I hope that corrects itself in time. These are the people whose job it is to sit down, often literally every day, with the actual end users of the system. And you might begin with a paper prototype where you sketch it on a piece of paper and say, what do you think, would this work for you? Mm -hmm. And you get the feedback and you revise the prototype and you revise the prototype. And that goes to the developers eventually to say, we figured out what they need, build this. Yeah. So in our work with the state on this, the person who had that position on behalf of the state as the intermediary between those designers and the, uh, the actual employees, these are call center workers for this, this Medicaid program. She had worked her whole career, she was close to retirement, for this, this state uh, health and human services agency. She had worked on this project with us for a few months. And she told us in one of the meetings, uh, with tears in her eyes, that this was the first time in her career that she'd ever felt so proud of her work, that she was able to go to people she'd worked with or people she'd hired over the years. She never rose very high in the organization in terms of the org chart, I would say differently in the work that she did. She was able to work with people just a couple steps below her and find out what their needs were. They were heard, they were listened to and they were heard, their opinions were respected and she was able to go back to them and say, look what we made for you. You told us you needed this and we did it. And what that does for morale and agencies is enormous. To invert that org chart in terms of priorities and make the least important people the most important people to make sure that what's delivered to taxpayers, that the way government functions is the most effective, is really moving. And to see the impact that it has on morale and agencies is a delight. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Santana. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation, and I really appreciate the fact that you have, it sounds like, gone across um, all different states to tell them how um, they can improve technology and enhance it for the end user, which is our constituents. But I wanted to ask you, um, as far as when you look at states that are actually implementing technology changes, who do you feel is doing it best as far as best practices? And secondly, um, when it comes to our state, um, it sounds like you've done some analysis on just how much we're spending when it comes to technology mm -hmm. and how we could be more efficient. So I just wanted to kind of get your, a little bit of your perspective on uh, what are some of the, like maybe two top things that we can do right away to make um, efficiencies better. Sure. Uh, so to your first question, I, I can't tell you what states are doing things well for the reason that no states statewide are doing this well. There is no state that I can say they're doing an excellent job. There are many state agencies that are doing really stellar work. I have to point to Colorado, which recently established, I mean, just a few months ago, the Colorado Digital Service. They took the model of 18F and they made one in the state. That way they're not, when, when a state brings us in, that's terrible. That shouldn't have to happen, but even worse, by working with 18F, that knowledge is leaving the state. By creating their own version, their own program like that, that knowledge stays within the state and can be spread to other agencies to spread best practices. So Massachusetts has established a digital service. Uh, I believe Rhode Island is working on one. California has one just for their child welfare system. They found they needed, a, 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 I think they call it the child welfare digital service, uh, created it just for that. 
So what we see is uh, agencies that are doing extraordinary things, and we see states like that that are being set up to do some really great work, but it's gonna take a few years. This sort of culture change, there's that alarming phrase again, is hard and takes a long time. To your second question, I can't speak adequately to that. Um, th the agency level analysis that we've done has only been DHSS, and within that, or DHHS, I gotta work on my, my acronym there, um, and within that, we've mostly been looking at the child welfare system um, and about how, t how they can make the transition. Right now, the federal funding is under a standard uh, known as SACWIS, and the new standard is known as CWIS, and to continue getting funding, states need to move to the new CWIS model, and so the imperative is to move to that new approach, and we'll see what comes out uh, by five o'clock when we finish that meeting, but the goal there is to find a small chunk to begin with, and not a $20 million chunk, not a $50 million chunk, but something smaller. If I were to try to answer your question any further than that, I would be making things up. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Irwin? I, I, uh, my question was just asked by Senator Santana, which is to what extent have you looked at Michigan? Because I look at your six best practices and recommendations here, and it reads like a roadmap of our state's failures with technology procurement over the course of the last 10 years. And so what I'm really looking for is some sort of analysis. It sounds like you're not in a position to actually say whether or not we are using open source or whether or not we are employing technology professionals that have the capacity to um, you know, be in-house um, tech counsel for us, so to speak. So, I mean, if you wanna make any more comments on it, I guess I just will say it, um, that was my question, and I hope that the um, committee will take this presentation extremely seriously, because not only is this, I think, an opportunity for bipartisanship, because nobody likes to waste money, uh, but these are good ideas that we're not employing that we should be. So I don't know if you wanna characterize our current um, uh, progress over the last 10 years, but that's kind of what I was getting at. Yes, Senator, thank you. In fact, I, I should have answered the spirit of Senator Santana's question more than the, the specifics, because that I could have done better. Uh, yesterday, in our meetings with uh, DTMB, and then meeting with Senate fiscal staff, um, I, I, we have been, my team and I, enormously impressed by what we've heard. Usually, it takes hours of explanation to get to the point where some of the questions or objections are raised that we heard, and instead, right out of the gate, we'd see head nodding, and no, 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 we know that, go ahead, we've got it. Um, some of the, we saw none of the negative science that we usually see with states, uh, and we mostly were feeling very cocky <laughs> that we chose Michigan as the first state. It seems like an excellent decision, and I think it's because y'all, y'all have made all the mistakes already, and I say that, because that's what we did at 18F, that's what I've done personally, we're still making those mistakes at a federal level. Uh, I believe that Michigan, in terms of what we heard in those meetings yesterday and what we heard this morning from DHHS, is extraordinarily well positioned for improvement. Uh, I think that we're going to be able to leave here and we'll hear some amazing story in a year and we'll take credit with our agency, who's probably watching this video right now, so I'm undermining myself, but the reality is I think we're more catalysts for the change that is already prepared to happen here. We, we heard uh, from, from DTMB, I think they were trying to downplay it a little bit, but they said, yeah, we just have some pockets of, of use of Agile. And I said, no, that's wonderful. If you tried to do it all at once, there'd be a big, horrible failure, and you wouldn't know what to do. But you're starting with these little test cases, and the sooner that you can build on those and share that knowledge and grow, the better off you'll be. So my characterization is, yes, I'd say that things are rough, but my God, you're on a path to a better place. Senator, when you had a follow-up? Just real quick, I appreciate the answer. I also want to just highlight on page 27 some a fact that you have in your report, which is that uh, in places like California, Washington, New York, Virginia, and Maryland, the cost of employing an Agile team can be at least twice the cost of employing such a team in the Midwest. And I would just point out that we're in the Midwest and we have an opportunity to grow this industry here. We've got an amazing security cluster. Uh, we got a lot to build on here. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Baer? Um, thanks very much. I, I uh, come out of the IT industry and actually had a company that worked in, in different ways with the state government here before I ever thought of working here. <laughs> um, challenging to say the least. Um, part of it, is, I mean, the bulk of it is the purchasing process, the, the overall, the lack of uh, actual technology people, right? It's a, yes. a government, a, a layer of management that hires very, very large outsourcing companies that start with huge contracts, right? So it's impossible to be agile in that environment. How do you take that apart?
Thank you, Senator. Yes, I, uh, so th the number one thing that I recommend along those lines is that the Senate cannot merely fund the outsourced work. There are two other positions that must be funded. The first is at an agency level, those product owners, those people who are in charge of the projects on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's been, been pointed out to me by DHHS this morning, they're saying, well, so we need to take really experienced people who really understand how we do things, serving in key positions, and then have them not do that and instead be in charge of our projects? And I said, I guess that's what we're asking, yeah. And they said, okay, but who's gonna do their old job? I said, well, I don't know, you're gonna have to, have to figure that out, that there's additional personnel required. Now, in the scale of the overall cost of these procurements, it's very, very little, but we all understand that the money for those capital expenses comes out of a different pocket than hiring new employees. The second position is when that work is delivered at the end of those two-week increments, somebody has to inspect it. If you were buying a fleet of cars, you would have somebody with the expertise to look at cars and know if the cars are any good and if they're working, what they're supposed to get, if, that, if that's what you've gotten. Same thing with technology. Somebody has to read the code and say, this is good, or uh, no, you're not meeting the standards laid out within this contract, and that requires technologists to do that. You can only have one product owner per project and one project per product owner, but you can have, expect a software developer to, to work on two, three, four of these projects at a time uh, to be able to do those reviews. That could be centralized at DTMB. That doesn't have to be agency employees. But ultimately, you have to take some chunk of what you're currently spending on outsourcing all of that work, take some chunk of it and use it to fund those staff positions to ensure that that work is a success and is meeting government standards. Thank you for your question. Thank you, that is all the questions I think we currently have. Um, we do, Mr. Jake, um, thank you so much for taking time. Thank you for We're the opportunity. Very pleased that you've been able to capitalize the uh, trip with the meetings with the departments as well. So we appreciate that as well. And so um, I think that uh, your comments and others have used this as a footprint um, on how to look to the future and how we do it is, is actually very exciting um, and we appreciate it. So thank you uh, with that. And with that, I will accept a motion from Senator Bumstead, supported by Senator Victory, uh, to adjourn. We are adjourned.